Hello everyone and welcome to the Health Data Research UK public webinar. We're all in this together. It's really fantastic to see so many people have come to join us on a Friday. I hope you're all not as damp as things are here where I am. But thank you so much for spending your time with us. We really, really do appreciate it. So we're going to have a chat with some experts from the world of health data research to find out a bit more about the response that's been got going on to the COVID-19 pandemic and then what we need to do going forward to make sure that everyone is included in the research that we do to make sure that the benefits are available to all. So um, first of all, a little housekeeping. Uh, next slide, please. So please do ask questions for the panel. The way this is going to work, we're going to have a short little talk from each of them, and then we'll throw it over to questions. So please, if you have questions, can you use the Q&A function? Uh, we also do have chat, so please do share your thoughts, say hello. My colleague Sarah Hazel is going to be monitoring that, so um, she'll be popping in links, she can add extra information. So please do say hello and share your thoughts. We're also making this webinar available with closed captioning. If that's something that you'd like to follow along with, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see the button that says CC, closed caption. So if you click that, you will get the captions coming up in Zoom. We also have a web link that will just be running the live transcript. So if you'd rather follow through your web browser, Sarah is going to pop the link in the chat there as well. So you can follow along through there. So hopefully that all makes sense. Hopefully that all works. We also are on Twitter. So if you uh, would like to tweet along live, so please do follow us. We're at HDR underscore UK. And if you could use the hashtag, hashtag health data together, that would be really great. So let's introduce the panel. Uh, Fran, next slide, please. So just to say who I am, my name's Kat Arney. I'm a science writer and broadcaster. I'm creative director of First Create the Media, and we've been working with HDR UK to help them uh, tell the story about their research to the world and, and help them sort of uh, get across the importance of health data research and how we're all gonna get forward with it. We are very lucky to have the Chief Executive Officer of Health Data Research UK, Caroline Cake, joining us. We have Rosita Zachary. She's a senior lecturer at King's College London and a consultant cardiologist. We have Becca Wilson, who is an HDR UK UKRI Innovation Fellow from the University of Liverpool and also a disability advocate. We have Hussein Ibrahim from the University of Birmingham. He's a junior doctor and a clinical research fellow. And we also have Melissa Lewis-Brown, who's the science manager and diversity lead at HDR UK. So that is our panel. And without further ado, I hope everyone can hear me. I hope everyone can see us. So uh, if you're using the closed captioning and you're tweeting if you wish to, let's crack on with Caroline. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kat. And um, lovely to meet everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people um, on, online and um, listening in today. So they're great to see you all. Um, so I'm Caroline Cake. I'm Chief Exec at Health Data Research UK. And what I'm gonna do is give you a brief overview of what HDR UK has been doing over this period. So if we can go into the next slide, please. So HDR UK is the National Institute for Health Data Science. Um, our mission, as it says here, is to unite the UK's health data to enable discoveries that improve people's lives. Um, so everything we're doing is around actually how we bring data together and actually get that being used to make a difference in terms of um, each of our lives and, and, and particularly very um, appropriately through the, through the COVID period. Next slide, please. Um, we're doing this um, three, through three core um, things that we're doing, and you'll see all of everything we're doing is orientated in the centre here about having um, impact, um, health and care impact, and um, from the outside about working closely with patients and um, uh, practitioners and the public, but also the users of health data, and also how we work together across all the different organisations that are involved in Health Data Research UK. Um, the three things we're doing um, so are around um, uniting health data, so that's around how we bring together all the different sources of health data across the UK in a trustworthy way for access and use, around how that health data is improved, so how the quality of that data is improved, and then thirdly around um, how it's actually being used and what different purposes, so for example around use of um, for public health from um, understanding causes of disease, clinical trials, um, and how it's used within NHS settings. So next slide, please. 
Um, during then in the COVID period, what we've been doing are three big things. Uh, one is actually working and coordinating the, the, the different efforts, the research efforts associated with COVID-19. Secondly, then around en enabling and accelerating access to the data sets needed to support those research efforts. And then thirdly, around actually ensuring that the wider impacts of COVID-19 um, are addressed and supported in terms of having the data and information to understand the impacts on vulnerable groups on that. We've been working through, um, actually, there have been about 110 different health data research questions that have been prioritised for our approach um, and have been working about um, accelerating the access to data for those. Next slide, please. And what's been fantastic through this period has been the, the kind of support um, from members of the public. In the very early days, we, we got um, 62 volunteers came together um, to support us from patient um, advisory group. Um, and you've got lovely photos here of um, Claire and Margaret, two of our public advisory board members. Um, what they've been doing throughout this process is actually helping us to prioritise which questions need to be answered first, how we then we've been supporting SAGE in terms of helping them understand what's coming out of the health data to inform the national response, um, and then contributing to helping shaping the design of research projects so that they really are taking into account the patient needs and requirements on that. Next slide, please. And what's come out already is, um, as, as many of you will be aware, um, are the kind of insights that have been generated from health data research. And this is an awful lot in this slide, and these are just 12, 12 kind of top things um, that hopefully many of you will be aware of. I'll just draw a couple of them out because I think some really nice ones. So for example, the, um, those who've been involved in the symptom tracker will know that the, um, that kind of, um, the work that was done through that about identifying the loss of sense of smell being a very early um, kind of um, identifier of um, COVID has been in a symptom based on that data that being able to to then being fed into the system from here. Also aspects in terms of a recovery trial, um, identifying that the drug um, dexamethasone, uh, being able to actually um, reduce the impact um, for people who've got um, severe um, COVID, who are severely ill with COVID. So, and all of these things have then helped um, our knowledge. And you can see from the examples in here, really on a very broad spectrum of how the disease is affecting all of us as a society. Next slide, please. And that's required. Um, so really to get those sorts of insights and more that we're going to be needing over the coming months, it requires a huge effort from everyone across the UK, from the breadth of people involved in um, each of these studies, um, in terms of the, the symptom tracker, the number of people participating in that, through the GP records, the data that's being utilised in secure ways to inform understanding how patients have been enrolled in, in, enrolled in hospitals through to get onto trials on that. So you can see from the numbers here, really the thousands and millions of people who are contributing to this collective understanding. Next slide, please. And so the key message, which is the kind of the, the premise of all this whole conversation today is actually how we all work together over the months ahead to really build our understanding and get to better answers um, to, to support the COVID response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. That's, that's great. We're going to move on to Rosita Zachary. If you do have any questions for the panel, Caroline, unfortunately, does have to hop off, but we will have Melissa from Health Data Research UK, and we'll be able to pop some answers in the, in the chat as well. But if you have questions for the panelists, please do put them in the Q&A so that we can see them. So our next panelist is Rosita Zachary. She is a, um, she is a senior clinical lecturer at King's College London. She's an honorary consultant cardiologist at King's College and Guys and Thomas's Hospital. Hospitals, and she's particularly interested in how do we use health data to understand, particularly for people with heart failure, cardiovascular disease, to diagnose them and to manage them more effectively. But she and her team have been doing some really, really important work during COVID-19 using health data to understand the pandemic. So Rosita, I will hand over to you to explain more. Thank you very much, Kat. Can you hear me? So thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm delighted to take part in this meeting. Uh, in my talk today, I'm going to give you an example of how we used routine health data to better understand uh, the risks of who's at risk of severe COVID-19. Next slide. So we all know that COVID-19 is a new disease and therefore there is an urgent need for new information. We needed to know who's at risk of severe infection, who may be admitted to hospital, uh, among those who, which patient groups are at highest risk of dying from this disease. Now we can find some of the answers to these questions in routinely collected electronic health records. If you think about it, every time a person has contact with the health service, we record information to help deliver that person's care. But if researchers such as myself can have access to those data in a secure and anonymized way, we can get valuable insights to help 
improve the care of other patients and public health in general. And the second point I would make is that big national data sets give us important information about the average effect across the whole country. But there's huge regional variation. And if you wanted to tease out from that the particular risks for your local community, then we would need to consider the characteristics of the local population. So in our project, we wanted to know among the, uh, our population in southeast London, which patients were at high risk of needing admission to hospital or having poor outcomes from COVID-19. Next slide. So to do this, we first gained approval from a research ethics committee to gain access to two data sets. The first were anonymized hospital records for over 1,500 adults who tested positive for COVID-19 in King's College Hospital and Princess Royal University Hospitals in South London. And the second was Lambeth DataNet, which is a unique collection of anonymized GP records for more than 300,000 residents in Lambeth and the surrounding boroughs. Now, what's unique about these two data sets is that we had disaggregated data on factors such as age, sex, self-reported ethnicity, pre-existing health conditions, and a measure of socioeconomic deprivation to a level of detail that you sometimes don't get with big national data sets. We integrated these two data sources to perform what's known as a case control study. So that means that we compared hospital data for patients with COVID-19 who were the cases with population data for residents without COVID-19 who were the controls in order to find out which of these factors might be driving hospital admissions, either individually or combined. Next slide, please. So our main findings were that older age and male sex put you at a higher risk of needing hospital admission. Interestingly, patients from black and minority ethnic groups who were admitted to hospital were about 10 to 15 years younger than white patients. We looked at a range of pre-existing health conditions, including cardiovascular diseases, and all of them increased your risk of needing hospital admission for severe COVID-19. High blood pressure and diabetes were the most common. And when we accounted for all of these factors, still patients who were of black or mixed ethnicity were two to threefold more likely to be admitted to hospital than white patients. We followed up the patients who were admitted to hospital and actually it was the group with Asian ethnicity that seemed to have a higher risk of death, not patients from black or mixed ethnicity when we compared to white patients. Now, whenever we interpret observational data like these, it's always important to consider which pieces of information are missing or not representative that could bias your conclusions. So for that reason, we concluded that Asian ethnicity was possibly associated with an increased risk of death because we had a small proportion of Asian patients in our study sample. And we would want to repeat this with a larger proportion of Asian patients to be more confident in that particular result. But still overall, the findings from this study were an important first step towards understanding the impact of COVID-19 in Southeast London. And we fed back this information to the local NHS to help input, sort of determine the response and also to local researchers to, who are conducting further studies to understand why these factors increase your risk and crucially what actions we can take to mitigate those risks. Next slide, please. I just want to acknowledge that there were a large number of people who were involved in this research and several funders that are listed here. And if anyone's interested to look at the full findings, they'll be published in an open access journal, eClinical Medicine, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rosita. Our next panelist is Becca Wilson. She is a UKRI HDR UK fellow at the University of Liverpool. And as part of her research, she's looking at solutions for secure, safe data access for health data research. But she's also a disability advocate as well. So Becca, if you would like to uh, come to the floor and tell us a bit more about uh, your work in, in this area. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kat. Um... So yeah, so I decided that I was going to use this time to highlight um, some of some really important issues around disability inclusion within health research. And um, so can I have the next slide, please? So basically, you know, members of the public take part in all levels of uh, my lovely research cycle pyramid that I've put here. Um, next slide, please. And at a base level, I guess, uh, within the UK population, 20% of UK adults are disabled. So that's one in five adults. When we start looking at 
uh, the age category above the state pension age that actually rises to two in five UK adults that are disabled. And, uh, you know, when we start uh, recruiting, actively seeking people to take part in our research studies and when people start volunteering to participate in our research studies, we have to think about whether or not, uh, you know, we are getting representation of disability uh, within our research participants. Uh, can you press uh, next, please? Thanks. So is there representation of disabled people in our research studies? Is, is it proportional to the community that these research findings are actually going to be applied to in the end? And if not, you know, we need to think about are there particular motivations uh, that drive disabled people to be involved in research that may be different perhaps to um, non-disabled people? Are there particular barriers to, for disabled people to participate in our research? And, you know, is there a difference uh, in terms of the motivations between a disabled person participating as part of a project related to their particular health condition or disability versus motivations to participate in something that is applied to the general population? Next slide, please. And one of the ways that we can address this is actually by having more disabled people involved as stakeholders in terms of directing research and um, you know, I guess voicing their concerns and participating in consultation around the direction of these particular research projects. So yeah, so the greater diversity of stakeholders and for example, public advisors participating in projects, they can actually, um, next please, they can actually help identify potential barriers to participation before you've even started your study. And actually, they can come up with strategies to increase the diversity of participants that are recruited into your particular project. So why is this important? So from, a, I guess, our research science protects perspective, we know that disability is associated with additional social risks, such as uh, poverty, unemployment, difficulty in accessing healthcare and other public services. Next. Oh, sorry, can we go back one, please, thanks. And so it really highlights the importance as researchers that we need to do uh, research that's inclusive by design from the beginning. And, you know, we need to have equal representation of disabled people in re health research in order to improve the health outcomes of disabled people. Next, please. And the final level in which the public participates is at the um, the level where we start applying and using the findings from our research projects in developing guidelines and potentially national policy uh, to improve patient care and well-being. Next, please. I've designed it as a pyramid, but in reality, it's more like a very precariously balanced stack of blocks where the highest level importance and value is given to this level that is the application of the research findings as policy. Uh, next, please. But the the reality is that, you know, can you accurately apply research findings for patient care to the whole population? Um, are these relevant to disabled and applicable to disabled people if disabled people haven't been participating within the projects themselves? And I can give uh, a number of examples of policies that have come into place since uh, the lockdown and during this pandemic that have been applied, you know, nationally or to the general population but that have severely and detrimentally affected disabled people and actually sometimes even prevented them from participating in you know, everyday activities, I suppose. And so it really highlights the importance of ensuring that we have the most diverse range of, of people as possible participating and being included in all of our research projects. Thank you so much, Becca. It is so important. Our next speaker is Hussein Ibrahim, who is a clinical research fellow and a junior doctor at the University of Birmingham. And he's part of the Insight Health Data Research UK hub. And there's a story out today from the Insight team that is looking at a particularly important area, which is about how, if we don't make sure that many groups across the whole population, all groups across the population are included in health data research, that this risks entrenching inequality. So Hussein, I'll hand over to you to talk a bit more about, uh, about this issue. Thanks very much. Hello. Thanks for having me. Um... So hi everyone, my name is Hussein, and I'm going to use my five minute presentation today to talk about the importance of including everyone 
all members of society in health data research by telling you a little bit about what might happen in the future if we fail to do so. So first I'm going to tell you about a problem which is called health data poverty and how it risks creating a digital health divide. And then I'm going to tell you about some possible solutions which largely involve building broadly representative health data sets. Um, would you mind slip, skipping the slide? Thanks. So the problem. So it all starts really by um, understanding what we're doing with our health data. So um, today, the digitalized, digitalization of healthcare has meant that we're generating health data at unprecedented rates. And this health data has primary uses whereby we use it, where healthcare professionals use it to uh, make diagnosis and treatment decisions relating to our care. But it can additionally be used to help improve healthcare and healthcare services. So by pooling together small amounts of anonymized data relating to lots of different people, we can create big data sets which health data scientists can use to conduct health data research. And so it's with these secondary uses of health data um, that, that I'm mainly concerned about, and that's where we need inclusion. So the secondary uses of health data have been instrumental in driving discovery and innovation in the digital age, and have led to the development of a number of different digital um, health solutions, such as artificial intelligence systems for screening skin cancer. And so these technologies, they can be sustainably delivered at scale. So that's to say delivered to lots of people at a very low cost. And they promise to provide everyone with equitable access to expert level care, thereby narrowing the health and well-being gap across different parts of the population. So they promise to provide us with a lot. But crucially, the technologies are only as good as the data that's used to develop them. And they could be highly sensitive to differences in things like age, sex, ethnicity, but potentially many other things. So there's a risk that if people are underrepresented in the data sets that we use to develop these technologies, and they might be unable to benefit from them and may even come to harm from them. And that problem is what me and my team have defined as health data poverty. And to help illustrate it, I'm going to use a real life example of data poverty in action and then kind of ask you to imagine a hypothetical example of a health related um, data poverty. So I'm not sure if any of you have seen these videos, but there are some videos available online of automatic soap dispensers that do not dispense soap to people with darker skin because not enough people with darker skin were used during the development of that technology. So that's a pretty despicable example of data poverty in action. But imagine instead that it was an artificial intelligence system for screening suspected skin cancer that couldn't compute data from people with darker skin or worse, computed it, but computed it incorrectly because not enough people with darker skin was used during its development. So that would be an example of health data poverty. And clearly we can't afford to see that happen. But if we're not careful and we don't ensure that the health data sets we use to develop digital health technologies are representative of our whole population, then we'll end up creating technologies that are safe and effective for some people, but dangerous and defective for others. So instead of narrowing the health and well-being gap across the population, we'll actually create a digital health divide that will perpetuate existing inequalities and leave us with a two-tier health system of digital haves and digital have-nots. So that's the problem. And it's a potential problem and it's entirely preventable. So I'm now going to talk about the solutions. So I've just explained that if we develop technologies using unrepresentative health data sets that don't include all groups, that will create digital health technologies that don't work for the unincluded groups. So to prevent this from happening, we need to ensure that the technologies are developed using representative health data sets. And there's two ways we can ensure that happens. And I'm going to touch on these very briefly. So one option is to build new data sets that are adequately representative. And one of the ways of doing this, potentially the most efficient way, which is being led by HDR UK and its seven research hubs like Insight, where I um, am partly associated with, is to use routinely collected NHS health data to build big, broadly representative health data sets. And because that health data is being generated at every single healthcare encounter, we can actually generate these with relative ease and we can be quite confident that they represent the populations and whom they need to represent. And other options include enriching existing health data sets. So that's finding an existing data set, evaluating how representative it is of the general population and adding data from underrepresented groups as appropriate to make them representative. And in practice, it's likely that a combination of both approaches will be required. But whichever way we choose, it's imperative that we act early to ensure that everyone's included in our health data sets because we need to build these data sets before we build the technologies so that we can prevent the problem from happening in the first place and avoid creating a digital health divide. So really now is the time to act if we want to ensure that everyone 
ends up with equitable access to safe and effective digital health technologies that narrow rather than widen our health and wellbeing gap. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that's uh, really fantastic and such an important point. And then to finish up from our panel, we're going to hear from Melissa Lewis-Brown, who's the Science Manager at Health Data Research UK, to talk a bit about how Health Data Research UK is addressing some of these data gaps to hopefully avoid this kind of situation in the future. Melissa. Thanks, Kat. And um, thank you to the other speakers uh, for their interesting, I think, sobering at times um, and very thought provoking presentations. So, yeah, as Kat said, I just wanted to add a little further HDI UK um, context to this. Um, so I think that the aspirations for, for better diversity inclusion in the health data research space that um, today's speakers have alluded to um, are aligned very, very much so with HDI UK's um, diversity and inclusion policy, which was published just a few months ago. Um, but there is now some real momentum behind that policy and, and really delivering tangible actions on it. Um, so the, the policy outlines the four areas in which we aim to improve equality, diversity and inclusion. And that's, as, as, you, as you would expect, um, people, uh, data, as you know, Hussein alluded to there, um, perspectives, so the perspectives that we bring in to um, um, Health Data Research UK um, and its work. Um, and also the skills and training uh, th that we equip uh, the current and next generation of um, health data research scientists with. Um, so there are two specific priorities that we've set out and that we're, that we're currently working on, um, which are to proactively champion a significant increase in the diversity of data sets. And that's starting with um, the data sets that are accessible on our um, health data research innovation gateway. So that touches on the solution that Hussein um, suggested we should, we should be looking at. Um, and as well, um, proactively championing a significant, a significant increase in diversity of people who work for HDI UK or, or are members of HDI UK, who represent us, um, who advise us, um, but also, you know, critically important, those who, who will benefit from HDI UK research. Um, so as I say, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a huge momentum around this now. Um, which in part, um, you know, for many reasons, but in part that's been motivated by the uh, by the minority group related health inequalities with respect to the COVID pandemic that we've seen and that speakers today um, have discussed. Um, so we're currently in the, in the process of establishing sort of the baseline for where we are on those. Um, but already we've um, we've enacted, I think, in, in excess of 25 interventions to try to improve diversity and inclusion in our recruitment process. Um, in the events that we run, um, communications and engagement, as well as in the data space. Uh, but we, we acknowledge that there is a lot more to do. You know, we're making a start and we have uh, some really good plans, I think, in place. Um, and some of those plans and the progress that we've made so far have been uh, mentioned in the series of blogs that have been published this week as part of National Inclusion Week. So there's a blog each on people, data perspectives and skills in terms of the diversity inclusion space at HDI UK. Um, but, we, but this is a sort of um, a, a commitment that we are making um, to, to improve things. Um, over the lifetime of HDI UK and we will continue to um, engage with our community and beyond um, on this, uh, which leads me to HDI UK Voices. So um, on the slide you'll see there's a link there to this um, new network that anyone can join to get involved in HDI UK work um, and life. Uh, so you can choose what that involvement looks like. It might be to um, share your views on hot topic in health data research. Uh, it may be to help um, help us shape research projects that are underway or, or will be underway in, um, in the HDI UK uh, family, um, or to help us write engaging content on health data research um, uh, for, for the public um, to help that understanding. Uh, so anyone can join. You need not be pro-access with, with respect to health data, um, health data um, research. You know, we welcome all perspectives and views. Um, and I would uh, urge you to go and check that out if you're interested in, on our website to find out how you, how you can get involved. So thank you. And I'll hand back to Kat now for the, for the broader discussions. 
Thank you very much, Melissa. So we've got lots and lots of questions coming in. We also had a lot of questions submitted in advance as well. So hopefully we will get through as many of these as possible. So I think one of the questions that has come up several times is um, this uh, exemplified here, a question from David Thompson, who says, you want to involve all groups in society. How do you involve the 20% of society, according to the NHS, who are digitally excluded? And I'm assuming at this point, these are people who are not online, who don't have you know, apps and, and apps access to, to that kind of thing, who are heavy users of NHS facilities and not just older patients. So I don't know if any of the panel would like to talk to that, perhaps uh, Melissa and then uh, if any of the other panel as well. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I can I can answer the question, uh, but I can um, say that we uh, if, if this is an area that people are in, interested in, then we have um, so we hold a bi-monthly HDR UK webinar, which is targeted to the HDR UK community of researchers and technologists, but it's open to all. Um, and in our November webinar, we have um, Ijeoma Azodo, who is one of the co-founders of the Shuri Network, um, uh, the first NHS and care network of women of colour in, um, in digital health. And she'll be speaking on digital inclusion. Um, so she'll be addressing this very question. So um, and we'll be you know, looking to learn from her to see whether there's anything, uh, what, what, what we can do at HDR, HDR UK to address this. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Becca here, who's um, there's a prioritized research question about uh, why is the COVID-19 rate of death uh, for disabled people of all ages, but particularly younger people, significantly greater than those who are not disabled? Um, how can we understand this during any subsequent wave? So that's a, a research question that's been put forward as being important. Do you know about any research that's going on? What do you think should be the priorities here? So I think that there's quite a bit of ongoing research, but I'm not aware of anything beyond sort of like preliminary, preliminary findings um, at the moment. So I think people are very active in this research space. I think that um, it's a very complex issue trying to understand, um, for example, the impact of something like, um, you know, COVID-19 on uh, people that have perhaps multiple health conditions or multiple um, disabilities as well. And, it's also affected by, uh, for example, um, sort of additional issues around access to social care as well. And so because everything is a very large puzzle, so to speak, uh, with many, many parts that will affect, I guess, uh, those particular people. And, and so it's a very complex research question, basically, that's being trying to be answered. I guess um, I'm personally aware of projects uh, at the University of Liverpool, for example, run by colleagues of mine in, in my research group. Um, Dr. Cl Clarissa Giebel is studying the effects and the impact uh, of the lockdown on people living with dementia. So obviously this is an old, typically an older category of patient, but um, you know, from her research, she's been finding, uh, she's been speaking to carers and the patients themselves and looking at some of the, um, I guess, the concerns around decision making, uh, particularly based on the, their risk to COVID um, during the lockdown, when, for example, carers, paid carers, couldn't come in because they were sick themselves or there was a problem with a lack of uh, PPE for carers and, and things like that. And the decisions around um, people living with dementia and the unpaid carers of those people, how you know, those sorts of things impact their own, essentially their health and, and their own symptoms of living with dementia. And there's there's research like this going on in so many different ca categories of um, disabled groups. And some of this research is being run by disability charities as well. Mm. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but... <laughs> I think we, we'll, we'll, we'll move on, but th thanks very much. It's good to know that stuff is ongoing. I think we have a question that is uh, probably relevant to Rosita because you're working with health data sets from primary care, from hospitals. And there's a question about is qualitative and quantitative data being used? So in terms of the kind of data, maybe not just in COVID-19, but in your work to understand things like heart disease, cardiovascular disease, what kinds of data sets can you get access to and, and what sort of data is in there? And, and you know, what more kinds of data would you like to get access to? I think is another question. 
Well, that's a great question. Thank you. And obviously more data is always welcome. In terms of the routine health data, they're usually what we call quantitative. So it's usually does a person have a condition? Yes, no. And numbers, blood results, admission dates, and things like this. And those, the quality of those data is, is usually good. Obviously, there's some missing data in those quantitative data. And we have to always be wary of that. Um, in terms of who records smoking status or ethnicity. So there is a proportion of missing data that, that needs to be addressed as far as possible at the, when the data are entered, but also through analyses afterwards. There are now in our particular um, institutions, we have a, an informatics pipeline that's been developed over the last two years, where we're able to extract not just these quantitative structured fields in the electronic health records, but also the unstructured fields. So the things that the doctors write in handwritten notes in the text, which don't normally end up in electronic health record data. And we now, and I think some other institutes have the ability to extract these additional information. So these techniques will allow us to extract more qualitative information as well in terms of maybe looking at exercise capacity or other facts that features of health that will be important to include in research. Um, people do separate qualitative research to look at those factors as well, but we do need to try and bring them all together. Um, but for the data that we have in terms of quantitative and definitions, you know, validation studies have been done and we think they're fairly representative of the populations that we take them from. So what we have is good. We're improving it by looking at unstructured fields in the electronic health records, but obviously there's still a way to go. So actually, we've just written up a piece about this, about uh, we call it decoding doctor's writing, because there's all this information that's typed into medical records. So um, Sarah will find that link and pop it up. So we have a nice story about how that's, that information is being analysed using natural language processing to understand and, and make insights into COVID-19. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating field. Kind of more on the slightly uh, geekier machine learning analytical techniques, we have a question from Simon Rudkin for Hussein. He says, what advice would you offer to those developing new data science techniques to effectively highlight the issues from data poverty and cast light on the other questions uh, raised from health data? So I guess this is about what needs to happen? What do people need to take into account to make sure these technologies do work for everyone? Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question, actually. And um, I think part of the, the question sort of alludes to the solution in a way in that actually people developing these technologies have a responsibility to ensure that the data sets that they're using to develop the technologies are representative. Um, and when developing technology, you need data both to both to develop the technology, so to train it in a, you know, in a computer outside of a real clinical setting and you also need to validate it again outside of a, a real clinical setting using a different data set um, and ideally both of those data sets need to be um, need to be sort of declared so that the team who are developing the technology um, need to need to make it publicly available um, to relevant um, people to know exactly where that data came from um, who it represents and they need to be able to um, look at that data, access that data and ensure that it is truly representative. Um, another aspect of the solution though is actually in having um, sort of external validation data sets to so that saying if you if a company has developed a technology and they want it and they've said that it's been sort of developed, validated and it works, um, we'll need to, you know, a body will need to be able to take that um, software and apply it to a completely separate data set that um, is unseen to the algorithm. Um, and it needs to be able to work in that data set, which also itself needs to be representative. Um, so really the key is to have publicly available data sets that, that are, um, are representative, that can be used for both develop, development validation and then external validation as well. I just wanted to pick up on a, um, a point because you, you've talked about the importance of having inclusive data sets. So that is things like, you know, ethnicity and gender and age and including people with, with various disabilities. But in the story that we have out today, looking at data poverty, it's looking at uh, data in eye conditions. And it's actually pointing out that even at the level of the actual diseases where we have data sets for, it's not particularly inclusive, it is quite skewed. Could you sort of briefly talk to that? Yeah, sure. So that's the work that um, some members of my team have been working on with trying to map um, and sort of catalogue 
uh, all the publicly available eye health data sets. And that actually sort of uh, alluded to this problem and well, to this potential problem that that's on the horizon. Um, so I, and in my talk earlier, I, I mainly mentioned ethnicity and, um, and how health data poverty can manifest in that regard, but it can manifest in a whole, whole lot of other ways. So it can manifest across different population groups. So, you know, if you're developing an artificial intelligence system for diagnosing diabetic eye disease and training it on a health data set of retinal photographs, so photographs in the back of the eye um, of entirely US based eye pictures, then it's very difficult to be confident that that technology will actually work um, safely. It will be effective if you take the exact same technology and roll it out elsewhere in the world. So, you know, we need to make sure that health data sets actually on a global scale are representative across all populations. And so in, in our in that research with the eye catalogs, you know, there were actual disparities um, on a global level. So sort of whole regions um, of the world where there's very little, or almost no data. Um, but we also need to ensure that there's inclusion with it across disease groups. So, um, you know, if health data scientists are using health data to conduct health data research, um, and there's lots of high quality health data for people with say respiratory conditions, then it's possible for the health data scientists to do that research on respiratory conditions. Um, but if conversely, there's very little or low quality health data for people with say neurological conditions, then th those people with neurological conditions would be relatively health data impoverished and less likely yeah. to benefit from advances in health data research. Um, so it's important that, you know, all health, all of our health data sets are inclusive, both within populations, across populations, but also um, across different disease areas so that everyone can benefit from, you know, data-driven medical advances. Yeah, I guess you can't work with uh, what you ain't got. Um, Rosita. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add to your point earlier about developing the machine learning algorithms and data science, is that it's very important as well as the data is to also have an interdisciplinary team. So for health data scientists to work with healthcare professionals, and also when we apply for ethics, you often have patients and community organizers on the, on the ethics team so that we all identify what are the key questions that we want to ask and what are the realistic um, in terms of developing the algorithms that are useful in the real world and uh, include all the relevant information. So it's just to have multi interdisciplinary involvement all the way through. Uh, Becca. Agree what's been said about this. Um, I would also add that um, certainly within all the technology and computation projects that I've been involved in, we've always also included, um, for example, pub the public uh, involvement within our actual research. So the public, we address, we you know we we consult with the public about particular aspects in terms of concerns they may have around, for example, linking their patient data to other additional sources for research purposes uh, and things like that. And then we build our software and tools and processes around those, addressing those social concerns. And so I think that's also another really important aspect and about being transparent and open with the public about what you're actually doing in these tools with their data. That's a way to build public trust because ultimately there's no, there's very little use in developing a fantastic tool if the public has no trust in the use of that tool. So. I think that's an absolutely vital point. I, th I think that's a, probably a very good point to end on so that we can wrap up on time. So I want to say thank you so much to our panel. It's It's been a bit of a uh, whistle-stop tour through some of the uh, the points and the issues. So I hope everyone's found it useful. Can we go to the last slide, please, please, Fran? And picking up on Becca's point about engaging patients and the public, this is where we do the join us and have your say. So there's a new patient and public uh, network that we've launched called HDR UK Voices. Sarah will pop the link in the chat and it's it, we're just really trying to get as many diverse people involved in, in any level that you want. So whether that is just uh, getting the newsletter that HDR UK produces or being involved in things like simple surveys and polls or getting more involved in shaping research projects in a more consultative way. Please do get involved because the only way that we can make this stuff inclusive and including all the voices and all the range of opinions of patients and the public 
is through you all being involved in it. So it'd be really fantastic if you would like to get involved in that. So uh, please, the link is there. So if you're, you'd like to sign up, please do so. I'd also like to draw your attention to the information that's on the HDR UK website. If you'd like to know more about health data research, how it's used, there's lots of FAQs about sort of who can have access to your health data, what sort of things happen to it, what kind of data is collected, how is it safely accessed, all that kind of stuff. You can find the, uh, there's a tab called what is health data research, so that's up on the, the top of the website. And also there's lots of news and updates and stories about the way that health data research is helping to make progress, particularly helping us to understand the COVID-19 pandemic, who is more at risk, finding solutions, new treatments, and, and really understanding this disease. So you can find that in the news section. If you have any inquiries, uh, please, you can always email inquiries at hdruk.ac.uk. Please do follow us on Twitter. We're at hdr underscore UK and use the hashtag, hashtag health data together. Um, also, just uh, quickly in the last few minutes, we'll leave the chat open for a little bit, but let us know what you think. We'll be sending around an evaluation. Would you like more events like this? Was it useful to you? Do you want longer? Do you, <laughs> was it too long, too short? And, uh, and also it'd be really useful if you found the closed captioning helpful as well, because uh, this was a, a bit of an experiment. So it'd be really nice to know if that was useful to you and if that's a, a good thing to be doing. So please do consider joining the HDR UK Voices and thank you very much for your attention today. I hope you all have a really lovely weekend. Thank you very much.